Hello and welcome to Murder Analyzed. I'm Christina Moore. Now today's case is the Edmund Camper case. Edmund Camper III, because you had the grandfather Edmund, then you had the father Edmund, and then you had the Edmund, the serial killer. Edmund is also known by the co-ed uh, killer. Uh, he is a serial killer. And so in this video, there will be content that some people may find really upsetting. There is also clips from an interview in 1984 that um, Edmund um, uh, took with, um, and it was called um, no, no Apparent Motive, okay, but it's a fascinating, fascinating um, insight into the mind of this murderer. And without a doubt, this man is a serial killer. So what we need to do, I think, first is look back on his childhood. So he was born in California. Um, his mother was um, Carnell uh, and his father was um, Edmund. Now they divorced, I think, in 1957. And then um, he went to stay with his um, mother. He had two sisters, so he's a middle child. He had two sisters and um, the mother was a drunk as a terrible alcoholic. She criticised Edmund all his life and he sort of blames her for how he's turned out and why he's done these murders. Now, you know, he was doing this from a very young age. He was doing things from a very, very young age. He was um, killing the family pets. So I suppose you could say he's a stereotypical serial killer when we think about serial killers okay or what leads up to them being serial killers like in their actions and their behaviors as a child so edmund was kill, you know killing family pets he had already um tortured and killed one family pet which was the cat and then he had um chopped its head off and put it on a stake you know in the ground just the head the second cat that he killed, he actually tortured and killed that cat, and then took it to his room and kept that cat until the mother found it and um, got rid of it. So I think in the mother's defense here, you've got to think you have a child that is displaying cruelty, torture, the killing of animals. But, and then I think he's on the other hand saying he's doing it because of her because of her behavior towards him, how she treated him, how she made him feel constantly being put down. Because to be honest, this, this woman was, I think herself, not right um, by some of the behaviors that she was doing. But also she had put um, Edmund down to live in the basement, you know, would lock him in the basement and sleep in the basement. And she said, or he says it was to protect the two other sisters from him because there was some strange behavior going on there at a very young age with Edmund. He would like to play games with his sisters of where he would then be in, sat in an electric chair and he would role play this out to where he was actually, you know, on the floor shaking like he'd been electrocuted. He had this fascination with death from a very young age. So we have to think if, if, if it was your child, you know, exhibiting this behavior, what would you do in 1948, 1950s, 1960s, you know, when you're trying to protect these other children? But as I say, we don't know because unfortunately his mother was one of his victims. So she's not around to, to say, but you know, as he's moved on, I think, and got a little bit older, I mean, he was a very large child anyway. He was um, born at over 13 pounds, and by the age of 10, he was towering above his um, classmates and people, you know, at the same age. He was a very, very large man, um, even at that age. Now, he it was also said, that he even says it, that he's, you know, cut off the heads of the sisters' dolls and, and that. But he also says 
that the sister, his older sister, tried then to kill him. She tried to push him in front of a train. And, and also that she then, because the man couldn't swim, the boy couldn't swim when he was about 10 or 11, he nearly drowned in a swimming pool because she pushed him in to drown him. So obviously there was something going on in this household, in all this household, that just wasn't right. And so then that brings us on now, I suppose, to um, Edmund at 15. So I think because of this behaviour and because the mother couldn't control him and he couldn't stand her, I think it was a mixture of both um, from both sides. The mother couldn't cope, didn't want him, didn't like him, absolutely didn't like him, would put him down, would say he's no good, he's just like his father. He actually, actually despised the father. She despised um, Edmund himself. And so she sent him to live with the grandparent. Now, the grandparents were um, older and I think he got on well with the granddad, but he didn't get on well with his grandmother. He says, there's two different versions about what he says, why he killed these people, these the maternal grandparents, when he was 15, is that he says he wanted to know how it felt to kill someone. But I, I think that's just said by other people. I think what he says himself is, the grandmother was a very similar to the mother, to his mother. She was um, dictating, she was overpowering she was constantly on at him you know you're no good you need to do this you need you know, it's a constant constant um, pressure on this boy or so he thinks okay now he's 15 he's now at this stage around six foot tall so he's a very big lad even at this age and one day he was sitting in the kitchen at his grandmother's house having breakfast and she then started on again about things about him that pushing him, you know, to do things. Uh, the granddad had gone to the shop to buy some stuff. And what he did was, a few months earlier, the granddad had brought him a gun um, to use on the farm and, and stuff where he was staying. And he went and got that gun and he literally shot her, right? He, he just shot her. And <laughs> to get her out, to, to stop her, I think. But now he's thinking, my granddad's on his way back. Now this is the granddaddy actually liked, okay, got on well with this man. And he thought, what am I gonna do? So he thinks I'm gonna have to kill him because I don't want him to find out that his wife's dead. So when the granddad turns back up with the shopping, he shoots him as well. Then he sits calmly down, rings the mother, his mother, Carnell, who he can't stand really, and tells her what he's done. She then tells him to ring the police, and that's what he did. The police turn up, he's then arrested, and then he is taken to uh, court, but he is then put into um, a mental institution for the criminally insane, um, because then uh, the court psychiatrist diagnosed him with schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia. Now, I don't know if he was showing any signs of schizophrenia at that stage, but I think we are talking about now, you know, 50s, 60s time, where we didn't know as much about different disorders as we know today. So that was a diagnosis he has got. Whether it was a correct diagnosis, you know, later on it's proven it, it wasn't. But at the time, I think that's a diagnosis they gave him. And it's, um, he was sent then to this institution for the insane and um, allowed to... Um, you know, he was medicated and he was helped and he then started to assist then in this um, institution because he was a very clever lad. He had an IQ. I think at that stage when they tested him it was 137, it was later 145, you know, his IQ. So he was an intelligent, intelligent person, okay? Again, a very stere stereotypical a thing when we think about serial killers it's not always true they're not always highly intelligent but the ones that are usually are the ones that then have also hurt animals and had early lives and displayed different behaviors early on in their life 
So his IQ was very high, he's a very intelligent man, but he was a very, very manipulative man. He had the intelligence to understand how people worked. How can I get what I want? And, and that's sort of what he did. So then he would then give out therapies to other <laughs> inmates in this, you know, this is for the criminally insane, okay? So these people were either murderers or, you know, serious, serious ill health, mentally ill health people that had done some serious crimes that he is now allowed to help with the process of their recovery. This is how good this man was and is still. So after three years of doing, um, being in this um, institution for the criminally insane, uh, and it was a juvenile one because we don't forget he's only 15, and he had done all this where he would manipulated the staff, manipulated the um, psychiatrist, you know, and the, the psychologist to where they was even allowing him then to help with therapies on other inmates, where then he would ask them, you know, quietly, how, you know, for, I suppose, how can we say it, for assistance of how to do the perfect crime, you know, and, and that's what he did. They would tell him, don't keep the victims alive because you'll get caught. Kill them. And if you kill them, get rid of the bodies so that you can't be caught. So, when he was on his 21st birthday, he was released for the murders of his grandparents. From this insane asylum, this medical facility for the criminal insane that he had manipulated that he had then, um, you know, <laughs> tricked them so much because of the intelligence of this man and how he can read people and how he knows what to say to people to get what he wants, has now been released back to the care of his mother. And she took him, right? She took him back. So she now has this 21-year-old, six foot nine, 280 pound man, who has been then criminally insane. And actually, let's go back to the criminally insane bit because he was a juvenile. So what this psychiatrist or one psychiatrist recommended that when he's released, to give him a fresh start, all his <laughs> notes, all his, you know, this, this on his criminal record would be removed to give him a clean start because they felt that he was so cured, so rehabilitated that he could now be let out and let out with a clean slate. Now that's how good he was. I mean, give him some credit. You know, this man is, uh, is he, he, he knows what he's doing. So now he's out. It's now 1969 and Edmund's been released to the care of his mother. Again, nothing on his record. He can go about his life, everyday life, as he wishes, because there is no parole, there is, there, there is nothing, there's no one he has to see, <laughs> there's nothing. He can now move on with his life. Give him a clean slate, let him move on. Oh, and he did, he did move on. So at the time, his mother had already, I think in the time he'd been in, uh, in this institution had already been remarried somebody else and then divorced somebody else and then she ended up moving to Santa, Santa Cruz uh, a lovely area quiet area um, you know with um, a university there and she actually took a job within that university so she used to drive in and out of the campus and she also had the sticker on her car that allowed her to drive in and out of this campus 24 hours a day so I think with the, um, with now Edmund, he had now started community college because as I say, he is an intelligent man. He was an intelligent man, still is. Um, he'd started community college and then he'd got a little job, um, some menial jobs, you know, with the Department of Transport. So that's in 1971. 
he was doing sort of just little bits of jobs and stuff but in this at this time as well there was a car accident he was involved in a car accident and had been given some money in compensation for this car accident so this is now where he's brought now this car and he had a bit of money and then he moved out of his mother's apartment again though this man as with many people that are struggling with something else going on in their life so he's trying to now live this joint life and you can see by um, this tape that he's sort of talking about how he is to me and you he's portraying this normal person but inside what's going on so he had these menial jobs he had a, a, a roommate he had uh, started moved in and shared with a roommate and he wasn't great with money either so there was you know there, this money had been given he'd brought this car which enabled him then i suppose then to move on to the um, co-ed uh, murders now i don't think i can say um as good as he could explain it and so have a look at this clip when he talks about how it started because he he had picked up and picked up about 150 co-eds like you know these um students university students college students as they call them in america before he even made his first kill and i think now when we talk about the, the co-ed murders um this is where i want to now put in these sort of clips because he explains about this process he explains about the kills not into great detail because with with edmund he, he he never goes into great detail about them about what he did to them because what he did to them was you know um bad um, but he goes into detail about what he was thinking as he was leading up to his first kill and i think in this video clip he talks about the first and second kill so have a look at this And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in it because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God, I locked them in the trunk. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped, I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up, I stuck it back in my pants, now remembering I had one. I checked all my pockets and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. I thought I was pretty slick and went and tripped all over myself that first two murders. So. It's just showing you, isn't it, really, how he was homing his skills. Because remember, he'd, he'd already been in an, asylum, an insane asylum for the criminally insane. He'd been released at 21. He had then, he, they then talked about, in this asylum, with other criminally insane people, of how to get rid of bodies, how to not leave evidence. Don't keep them alive. So and I think that really shows. So as he's going now, he's got this new car. And he's picking up these girls. A few bodies now have been found. And people now on the news, on the television, are starting to talk about this, what they're, you know, AKA this co-ed killer. So he thinks, what can I do to not get caught? Because remember this man, is really thinking now of how he can kill more. He's really honed his skills. He's done his first few murders. You know, he's, and he says it himself, they weren't the best. So now he's really starting to think and get confident to do these sort of murders that he wants to do for his own sake and why he needs these girls. And I think when we talk about why he did it he says about his mother and you'll see a clip of that as well but he also talks about where he's picking up these girls 
and they were talking about this co-ed killer to him. So a few of them got away, I think, because they were talking about why someone would do that, why they're sitting in this car with the killer that they didn't know. Because this man comes across so nice. Plus though, because his mother worked at this college, he had the sticker that give him access to this college 24 hours a day and these co-eds were told don't start you know trying to get lifts from people hitchhiking lifts from people unless they have a sticker on their car and he had the sticker on his car because of the mother so they would get in his car and, and this man didn't just kill one at a time he killed two at a time he was that now you know focused on this kill that that's what he did and these poor girls got into this car thinking that there was two of them they're going to be okay he had a sticker on his car he came across as a nice man very personable very nice man educated man his mother worked at the university they of course they are going to get into this car and at that time you know you've got this free loving area these these kids are at college live in life hitchhiking was their only way to go and so they would jump in anyone's car even though they'd been warned not to and only get into a car with the sticker on it they still died you were involved in the campus because your mother worked there yes i was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was associated with college work college co-eds women and had had a very strong and violently outspoken position on men for much of my upbringing. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. And I watched the alcohol increase, I watched her social life drop off, I watched her get bizarre. She had terrible pain from her life earlier life, her upbringing, uh, a failed marriage with my father. I'm a constant reminder of that failure. I hate to distill it down into such uh, into one word realities like that. There's a lot that leads into that happening, but that is what happened. They represented not what my mother was, but what she liked, what she coveted, what was important to her, and I was destroying it. Why did you actually kill the girls? My frustration my inability to communicate socially, sexually. I wasn't impotent, but emotionally I was impotent. I was scared to death of failing in male-female relationships. I knew absolutely nothing about that whole area. Even if just sitting down and talking with the young lady, I need to be able to really communicate. And ironically enough, that's why I began picking people up. And I'm picking up young women and I'm going a little bit farther each time. It's a daring kind of a thing. At first there wasn't a gun. I'm driving along. We go to a vulnerable place where there aren't people watching, where I could act out and I say, no, I can't. And then a gun is in the car, hidden. And this craving, this awful, raging, eating feeling inside. I could feel it consuming my insides this fantastic passion uh, it was overwhelming me it was like drugs it was like alcohol a little isn't enough at first it is and as you adjust to that psychologically and physically you take more and more and more it's the same process so it finally came down to the thing of do I dare bring this gun out already realizing if that gun comes out something has to happen it was going to happen I didn't see it then, but it was going to happen. I was playing a dangerous game with a loaded gun that got us all. Mother worked at the campus, and I had an A sticker on my car, and obvious access day or night to the campus. I was picking up some very lovely young women. You know what, the, what we were talking about as we're driving around? Almost as often as not, this guy that's going around doing this stuff. And the second they started talking that, they didn't realize it, but they were getting a free ride. I couldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, I swear. You know. But they'd be telling me what all about this guy, and they're comparing notes, and judged me not to be that guy. 
I didn't look like it. It was getting easier to do. I was getting better at it. I was getting less detectable. I started flaunting that invisibility, severing a human head, two of them, at night in front of my mother's residence with her at home, my neighbors at home upstairs. Now, Edmund also talks about, in this interview in 1984, about he's not an expert. You know, talking about I'm not an expert in murder and he talks about I've been a murderer for 20 years like it's a job interview really and he also says about then that you know um there's a lot more people out there and we know we know there's a lot lot lots of serial killers out there um working at the same time he said at the same time in that area there's about there was more than 35 both men and women but I don't know I mean how does he know Yes, there has been some talk about that serial killers do work in the same area and they sort of know each other and they, they've got this thing that they can, they, they, they can tell. But I, I think with him, he's just assuming from himself because it was very easy in them days to be a serial killer. It's actually very easy today to be a serial killer. But I think in them days, it was a lot more easier to pick up your victims if they were college victims or something where people were hitchhiking and this, that and the other. So I think with him... He was talking about, you know, and he does say, I'm not an expert on this, but I'm just saying how I see it. And he, he calls it coming in from the cold. He came in from the cold and um, there is others then that still want to be out in the cold and still do what they do. And that is actually true. So have a look at that clip and see what you think about that. Well, I'm not an expert. I'm not an authority. I'm someone who has been a murderer for almost 20 years. Can you say how many people might be doing crimes like you were doing? It would be a guess, but it's not. It's far more than 35. It isn't that impossible in this society. It happens. Are there more people? They didn't give up. Uh, how he, many? she didn't give up. I did. I came in out of the cold. And what I'm saying is there are some people who prefer it in the cold. Good people see. A nice guy. I think the other thing with Edmund is um, he wanted to be a police officer. So don't forget his record was expunged and there, there was nothing else on his record that would have made him not be a police officer. And there is always, and you know, it's, it's well known thing that there's a fine line between a police officer and a serial killer. There's sort of, there is a fine line there. You know, the same personalities and the same scowl, if you want, if you want to look at it that way is that you know and he wanted to be a police officer and you've got to think why because he wanted the power it would have been easier for him then he wanted this authority he wanted people to look at me and i think a lot of um this interview is about his want to be um recognized for something because he'd been put down all his life and now it's like look at me I'm a serial killer, I'm going to give you these interviews, I'm going to talk about this because I'm an expert, you know, I have been murdering for 20 years. And I think his personality <laughs> comes through quite well in this. But so what he couldn't be a police officer because he was too tall. That was the only reason. He was actually too tall. He was, uh, I think, uh, six foot nine. Um, at that, that, at that stage. So he was, and they, that was then dismissed, but he did then used to go into this jewelry bar, which was full of police officers and stuff to um, mix with the police officers. And um, you listen to what he says about, in a minute when I play that clip, of what he listens to when he, when he says about why he would go in there. One, I think, because he liked it, but two, you're talking about a serial killer. Serial killers like or a lot of them, like to be in on the know. What do they know? Are they getting close to me? Do they, have they got any evidence? And I think these police officers, not that these police officers in this pub um, knew much. Me a beer, I'd buy them a beer. Uh, casual relationships, but that was, I was poking around a little bit trying to find some things out. I knew they wouldn't be privy to hot information, but there were some things that were bothering me, like were there any speculations on how they were dying? Did the cops like you? 
like I said, a friendly nuisance. I got in the way, and it was deliberate. Again, friendly nuisances are dismissed. So now let's talk about these murders in a bit more detail. So I've said that he was picking up quite a lot of females before he actually made his first kill. And he did. You know, he was getting used to his, his, his skill. He tells you in this clip that he had now taken out a gun. He was getting ready. He, knew, he had worked it out. His MO was now coming. You know, his, his plan was now coming together of how he was going to do this and how it was going to pan out. So after he had then honed his skills, I'll say, we can say, there was two um, Fresno uh, State students, and their names were Mary Ann Pierce and um, uh, Anita Lancia, and they, uh, they never made it after they got into his car. Because again, I've said before, who thinks that when you get into a car and there's two of you, because you know they say don't get in a car on your own, don't do this on your own, but there was two of them. And um, their families reported them missing. So on the 15th of August, there was a head found and um, it was discovered near the woods near in Santa Cruz. <coughs> and it was the, um, later it was identified as um, the remains of, because I think they found more remains as they was looking, um, of these two young girls, these first two victims. And I think the first two victims that he talks about in the video clip, um, about how he fumbled a little bit at first. This is talking about these two girls, and then their bodies were found, and uh, he'd removed their heads and their hands, um, and uh, he had engaged then in sexual um, activity once they were the corpses were dead okay um, the, the girls were dead they, they weren't alive and I think he also talks about in there about in this video also about then his um, you know that he wasn't impotent in physically being impotent but only in his mind. Well, I don't believe that. I think if you're going to rape someone when they're alive, it's different to raping or having sexual contact in any way with a corpse when they're dead. So don't forget he takes his victims back to his property. He takes his victims um, and keeps them. Um, he then dismembers, he uses them and um, for his own sexual gratification, the corpses, uh, and then discards them by chopping them up and throwing them away. So would I say he's impotent? Yes, I would. He'd never really had any contact, I think, in that way. With a, I think he was engaged at one point, but I don't think it, it lasted very long and that girl will not be named and, and nor we're now allowed to name her. And, and, and I, I agree with that as well. But I don't think there was ever any real sexual contact between him or another person alive. It was only when they were dead. So later that year, on September the 14th, 1972, um, he then picked up a 15-year-old and uh, Al Alkiku, her name was, who was, again, a hitchhiking and... Uh, she was waiting for the bus and, the, and the, she missed the bus and she needed to go to a dance class. So, you know, this girl's 15 and along comes Edmonds you were able to and appear picks her up. Ordinary person, non-threatening to... I lived as an ordinary so person most of my life, even though I was living a parallel and increasingly sick life, other life. One victim let me back in the car. I locked myself out. She opened the door for me. My gun was under the seat. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? I'm trying to show you just how awful this got, how commanding these rages got. I was raging inside. There was just incredible energies, positive and negative, uh, depending on a mood. 
that would trigger one or the other. And outside, I looked troubled at times. Other times, I looked moody. Uh, other times, perfectly serene. Not very sane. But again, people weren't even aware of what was happening. Their mind would that he would pick them up. He would either shoot them in the car, or he would either then take them somewhere secluded, um, attack them, kill them. them. So. In January 1973, um, Edmund continued um, on <laughs> and picking up a hitchhiker, Cindy Shaw was his next victim. And again, uh, she was shot and killed and um, took back. Now, I think by this time, I think he'd actually moved back into his mother's apartment with her. And then he would take the bodies inside or dismember them just outside take the bodies in and um, again you know, have sex with them. It was said that he had at one point he did admit to cannibalism and and stuff but then he doesn't, he denied that later on but I, to tell the truth with this man you know I think anything goes. Whatever this fantasy in his mind was it was being played out on these corpses all the time. Now these were young victims, young girls with, with, with a life ahead of them and I, you know, and he just discarded their body parts after he'd finished with them. He just chucked them all over the place. And um, sometimes when he would not take the whole body back to his apartment or his mother's apartment, he would then only take the head. And he describes in one of the clips where he's put the head in one of the victims bags so her own head now is in her bag and again he would take them back that head back and keep that head and do things with that head sexually with that things with that head and then um before either discarding them or burying them but how are you able to in one minute have someone's head in your hand and very shortly They're thereafter through a fantasy however that would relate to that severed head. And, and then five minutes later, I'd put that away and th there'd be a knock on the door and I'd put it away and answer the door and the landlady would be there and we'd discuss it. Discuss what? Reality. Her reality, not mine. Some people go crazy at that point. I felt it, it was one hell of a tweak. I mean, to just flip out and not know where I was to be walking up the stairs with a camera bag that belonged to a young woman that had her severed head in it. On February the 5th, 1973, uh, Edmund used this uh, camper, you know, parking sticker on his mother's, um, of, of his mother's, you know, to, to go around and, and, and pick up these girls so he could actually drive on then into the university and, and, and make it look like he was meant to be there. And, uh, there, again, he had, um, there was two more victims, so in total there were six co-ed victims, and the last two, um, one of the heads of the last two, he did then cut off and take home, but also bury under his mother's bedroom window and had it facing up, looking at her. So it's significant that these, kill, these killings, and as he said it himself, were related to something about his mother. This, you know, to prove to her. So now by this stage, right, it's 1973, and he's killed now six um, college students. He's already previously now killed the grandparents, paternal grandparents, been released from prison, uh, from um, uh, an insane asylum, uh, you know, with a expunged record so he can go on to do these other six killings. And now what happens is, he now turns on his mother. So in April 1973, Edmund commits what would be his last two murders. Um, and that was his mother. His mother was in bed and he was now at this stage now living back with his mother because he'd spent all his money and he, you know menial jobs and, and, and he couldn't afford to live anywhere else so he'd had to move back in and she took him back in. And at night, this, you know, don't forget this woman's working, so she's gone to work, she's come home, and then he wants to talk. But she's laying in bed, 
and she said to him, what, what is it? You want to talk now? You know, again, dismissing him, get out, you know, because the woman can't stand him. That's clear. And there was neighbours that said these, the fights between these two, you know, over the months leading up, even throughout these murders, were terrible. So this night, she's gone to bed, she's told him to get out, and he said, oh, okay, and he left her to sleep. He has then come back in when she was asleep and he has stabbed this woman, he has killed this woman, he has then dismembered this woman, he has then took the head of this woman and done the same things sexually he done to the other bodies, the other victims. But then he thinks, oh, how am I gonna get, you know, I'm gonna get caught for this. How can, how can I get away with it? Because I can't just say she's gone, she's got a job, people are gonna know that she's gone. So what he does, he rings her friend, Sally Hallett, one of her very good friend of Carnell's, the mother. So he rings her and says, come round for dinner. I'll make you dinner. You know, the mum's invited you round for dinner. So of course she turns up expecting to have this dinner. He murders her and he shoves her in the cupboard because he's thinking in his mind, I can then say they've gone away. They've gone on a holiday together. So now, again, he's killed someone like he killed the granddad because he doesn't want the granddad to find out about the murder. So he's killed the granddad. This time he's killed Sally because to make, to give him an excuse to get away with murder is that they've, just, they've, they've gone together, they've gone on a holiday. That's why she was murdered. He then literally leaves her in the cupboard, the dismembered body of the mother left there, and then goes off, runs off. So he's run off and he has um, you know, literally fled this area, but then thinks, mm, you know, I'm gonna to have to give myself up. So he's rung the police in this Santa Cruz area and told them what he'd done. They literally thought he was mad and discarded it. They didn't and said, look, ring back later. He couldn't believe it. He was waiting for hours and hours and, and, and thinking, I've rung him and told him I've done it. And you know, so in the end, he remembers a man or a police officer from the bar and he rung that police officer to come and <laughs> to tell him what he had done, not just then to his mother, and the friend, the mother's friend, but also that he was the co-ed killer. So of course this police officer's gone. Now you're talking about a man, as I said before, that's six foot nine inches tall. At that time he weighed 280 pounds. So to any man, this man is going to look big. Now luckily for them, when the police turned up, and it was one single police officer that turned up to arrest him, he held his hand out and he was handcuffed there and then. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fascinating to think that this one police officer went. I think, I don't know whether they believed him at that point or whether they thought he was just, you know, ringing up and saying it, but we'll have to check it out. But they, he was then arrested. So in October 1973, um, Edmund went on trial and uh, for in uh, for the murders, so he was he he was he was given he was charged with eight counts of first degree murder, and um, I think at that point there was issues about his sanity. So he was found guilty of all charges, and he was then given um, that was in early November. He was found guilty. Of all, of all eight charges. And he was given, um, actually at Kemper at that stage, wanted then to be killed, you know, because this was his fantasy right from when he was a child. Give me the electric chair, give me something. But that time in California, that had all stopped, you know, so that, and I, I think this is the issue now. He, he was now going to spend the rest of his life in prison. So I think with Kemper, we automatically assume because he had been then in a sane, in a sane asylum for the criminally insane when he was 15, that we would assume that then the court would have, I suppose, put up a defence 
of, um, or he would put up a defence of that he was, you know, diminished responsibility, criminally insane, that means he wouldn't have been um, uh, responsible for his actions. But I think because the first diagnosis of schizophrenia, again, as I said to you before, was just sort of discounted, we have to think about why they didn't do that. So what, what the um, court has said, so they, they, to, to establish a, a defence um, on the grounds of insanity, it must be clearly proven that at the time of committing this act, that the party accused of labouring under such a defect of reason from the dis, um, deceased mind. Now, they didn't agree with the psychiatrist from the um, court psychiatrist that had said that he had schizophrenia. They said no, that was not that was not true because he didn't have any of the factors that would have come into someone with having schizophrenia. He wasn't having these um, clear, you know, signs of someone with schizophrenia. He wasn't delusional. He wasn't hallucinating. He didn't have, you know, um, either someone in his mind telling him to do it, do this, kill it. It was him. And so this is why I think they said no, um, there's no way that he could have um, been insane at the time of these murders. And actually they said he probably wasn't insane at the time of the murders of the parents. That diagnosis of schizophrenia or paranoid schizophrenia was wrong at that time. But again, I've said before that at that time, you know, we didn't know enough about the brain. So I think what, the, what they said in court to stop him going on this defence of criminally insane was that he did show signs of malice of forethought. Now, you know, you had planned these. You knew what you was doing. And this is the thing, when, when people think they can use mental health as a excuse for murder you can't because one way or the other you know you're you're going to have to pay for your crimes and what they're saying with um edmund kemper is is that he knew what he was doing was wrong he understood the consequences for doing that not because he was under mental health or there was any mental health going on but because he just knew he chose willingly chose to go out and murder someone using the malice of forethought. He knew it in his mind, he knew what he was doing was wrong. And that is something that wasn't, wouldn't be present if you were suffering with a, uh, an illness that gave you diminished responsibility under the law. So it was really clearly proven. Uh, it's, he, it said, and I think he, he testified that he killed these victims because he wanted them. Do you remember? He wanted them for his own self, for him to be, <laughs> to be his. And then what he did with them bodies after that, well, you, you could say, and people say, he must have been mad to do that. No, some people like to murder. Some people like to kill. You know, there doesn't always have to be a reason why what we can understand. You know, as human beings, we are different. So I've talked about an appeal and I've said to you about uh, Kemper could be, and I think he's, he was first eligible for parole in um, 1979. You know, okay. But um, again, he, he was uh, uh, denied that parole. So you're not, he does say, oh, I want to stay in prison but then he continues to go for these appeals. Some years he drops off and he doesn't want to do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. So from 1979, uh, then he was den denied, uh, uh, denied parole. And then at the parole hearing in 1980, 1981 and 1982, um, he was also denied. Uh, again, at the parole hearing, in, in, um, he waived his rights in 1985, so he didn't take it in 1985. He was denied parole in 1988. Uh, where he said uh, society is not ready for me in any shape or form um, and then again um, and he said I can't, I can't fault them for that 
Then again, he was denied parole in 1991 and 1994. He then wavered his rights in 1997 to 2002. Then he attended the next hearing in 2007, uh, and he again was denied this again. Uh, <laughs> and then Kemper waived his rights in 2012, and he was then denied, uh, denied a parole hearing in 2017. And his next time he's eligible for parole, parole is 2024. So he's contradicting himself constantly, isn't he, really? Because one, he's saying, no, I don't want it. I'm going to waver that. I don't really want to get out. You know, you can't handle me. And the other one, you're, you're still going for this parole. Uh, you know, will this man ever be released? No. No. I think the prosecutor, uh, um, Simmons, said that we don't care how many, um, how or how much uh, much he, he says he's this model prisoner and what he does in prison. He is a model prisoner. Absolutely. But he was a model prisoner back when he was 15. And then look what he went out to do, you know, to do. He is a manipulator. He is someone that manipulates or tries to manipulate the system, the people working in that system. And I don't think for him, luckily, that isn't working anymore. And I don't think this man will ever, ever be released. Uh, you, you just couldn't. But again, he's up for pro in 2024, so we'll see how he goes on that one. I think now we have to really talk about, don't we, Mindhunter? You know, that fantastic Netflix series. I love it. You know, uh, where um, he's portrayed, actually, I think where Cameron Britton portrays him um, on, on this Netflix series. And uh, what a great job then he does as well. There, there is so much, um, I think, that we can learn, right, from these sort of things like serial killers and these interviews that they've given. And I do wish that there'd been more and more and more of them. There wasn't that many more um, of these interviews. And it's really un unfortunate, I think, because the FBI and, you know, their their unit that they, they do um, is an amazing. They are probably the best in the world at what they do when it comes to profiling serial killers because they've done it for so long. And the, the people that set that up have really, really thought about, I think, over the years. If you're going to stop someone doing something, you have to try and know what's in their mind. And I've said this before that, you know, we're human beings. We can't mind read. You don't know. You can assume what's going on in a killer's mind. You can assume what they may be or where they may come from, what age they are. But to actually know... It's very difficult, and I think when you look at these, this interview tape of Edmund, I think that makes it even more clearer, because how intelligent this man was, how he comes across. Obviously, not everything he's saying is the truth, because he won't say it. He won't say about certain things in this case, as you know, about you know uh, sleeping with dead bodies. No, that's not the issue here. That what I think these the they're trying to get at um, in these, you know when we look at profiling is how can we stop somebody else and I think he says that himself if there is someone out there that is leading up to being a serial killer and you know watch these interviews of Kemper and others that have done these interviews it may stop them go and get some help now but I think as I always say serial killers are out there now look at that video he doesn't look like the monster that you think these people are. They're normal people. They have normal lives. On the outside is what's going in inside, inside here, that we can't see. We can't see. This man was in a pub with police officers. No one, you know, they haven't got a sign on their head that says, I am a serial killer. I am dangerous. So I think <laughs> if you take anything from this, Keep an uh, open mind about who you know, what you do, where you go. Always. Always. And I've said this before because Pete, serial killers are just like me and you. It could even be your neighbour. You wouldn't know. You just wouldn't know. So anyway, this has been the case of Edmund Kemper III. And I hope you found this interesting because it is a fascinating case. Uh, there's a lot of history on him, and I'm going to put on the um, clips from this uh, interview 
you know, no apparent motive interview. And I'll also put a link on here to give you the um, link so that you can go direct and watch the whole um, thing yourself. It is fascinating. I think some few little facts I think about maybe that what I may have missed out, I suppose, in this will help you understand about um, the personality of Edmund. So he was um, incarcerated in the uh, California medical uh, facility, okay, and uh, with other notorious criminals such as um, Herbert Mullins and also Charles Manson. Uh, two different stories on their own, them two. Um, but Edmund just, just showed disdain for um, Mullins. Uh, he had committed murders also at the same time and in the same area as Kemper and, that, and this is, I think this is, there was another murder in Euphrasia that committed murders in that area at the same time. So Santa Cruz was known as the murder capital for a, a, a point there, so God knows what was going on in this area. I think it was because of the easy lifestyle that Santa Cruz offered, it was a relaxing uh, you know, environment and, and so you had three serial killers at the same time now working in the same area. As this, so you know, there was, there's there's a lot going on in, in that area at the time, but um, with Mullins, uh, you know, he just um, Edmund literally hated him. He couldn't stand him, and uh, he used to be um, quite loud and and uh, you know, and he, he he says, now this is Edmund saying it. This is a serial killer that killed and dismembered all these bodies, and God knows what else he did calling Mullins a cold-blooded killer. You know, so you think, is there even hierarchy here? I don't know. And because Mullins would usually whistle or stuff like that or sing, uh, he, Edmund, could not stand it. He wants to be the centre of attention. He likes to be in control. And I think with, um, <laughs> because he'd had all these treatments in the early days, Edmund, where he was, you know, and he'd also undertook treatments and help to assist undertake treatments on other prisoners, um, he was now trying to um, sort of sort this prisoner out, you know, so where he could tolerate him. And, uh, you know, um, he, he had, Mullins in the end had to ask permission from Edmonds, could he sing? Okay, so this is called uh, behaviour modification um, treatment, which he says which um, Edmund says that he had done on Mullins, another cold-blooded serial killer. Now, and you're the cold-blooded serial killer. But he just, you see how he just, he, 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 he distances himself between one serial killer and himself. He justifies what he did because, oh, my mother made me do it, or things she'd done in a child made me do it. But then he thinks there's another serial killer and Charles Manson as his cold-blooded killers. And, and so that also should give you some insight into the behaviour, into the mind of this man. He's not as clear cut as just watching him on this video and, and, and he, you know, he doesn't come across cold and you can understand why these girls got in this car, but it's what's really going on in there. Because even this, this interview is some form of manipulation from him. In his mind, there's a reason why he done that interview. And that's why a lot of serial killers won't do interviews because they're not really that bothered about what you think of them. With Edmund, he was worried about what you think about him. Look at me. I'm a serial killer. And that's why he didn't get diminished responsibility either because he's not criminally insane. He's a psychopath, but he's not criminally insane. So, this has been the Edmund Kemper the third case, a USA, United States of America, serial killer. That's exactly what he is, a serial killer. Still in prison in California, still there and will remain there probably for the rest of his natural life. And so should he, without a doubt, so should he. So I hope that you found this case interesting. You know what to do? You put your thumbs up. I always go like this, but I know it's a button down there. You press and, and put the thumbs up. You can um, subscribe to us by hitting the little thing that Lacey puts up in that corner. You know, the um, logo, just hit on that and subscribe to us. Um, share these videos out if you like them. Tell, tell your friends about them. But also, you can also follow us on um, Instagram and on Facebook. 
And as I always say, I like to have a chat about murder. So let's have a chat about murder. So thank you for watching. And until the next time, bye-bye.